Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the first part of what if Deku became a vigilante. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 1, A Usual Patrol Kitsune ran across the rooftops, a grin underneath the mask as adrenaline pumped through his veins. His quirk hummed underneath his skin as he pranced above the city, using the grappling hooks in his bracers to bridge the distance between buildings when the gaps were too big. He had the lights of his mask turned on, and anyone watching would just see the neon green outline of a Kitsune face as he leaped. The night was still young, but so far it had been quiet, even in the nastier parts of Musudafu. He got a cat down from a tree, stopped a few muggings, and even managed to hit a drug dealer. Drug dealers were the ones who usually had the most cash on them. While Kitsune never really wanted to steal from criminals, he kind of had to. His survival trumps whatever morals would have otherwise gotten in the way. He took a breather, perching on the ledge of a rooftop while he silently counted the stacks of bills he collected from patrol. Normally he would have company, but the AI in his mask was actually turned off today to process the updates he made last night. It was pretty lucky that tonight's patrol was so quiet. Really, all her being quiet meant was that he had to actually scroll through the computer in his mask manually instead of sure Yoni opening the information he needs on her own. Shit, Kitsune muttered, stuffing the bills back into one of his pockets. The night was still young, but he needed to hit a few more criminals. The way this was going, he's going to have to rely on charity if he didn't want to have to skip a few more meals. He supposed he could cut the water, but that was something he absolutely would not do. It's not a measure he's had to take since he was 13, and he intended to keep it that way. Pulling out his phone, he did some searches. It was a burner phone, not connected to a network, and specially modified for his work. One of the cases he was tracking for anonymous tip-offs to the law was a drug ring. He'll go look for updates, maybe see if he could knock a few out and steal enough for groceries. But the underground chatter said that a deal wouldn't be happening until tomorrow at the earliest. He groaned pocketing his phone as he stood up and continued onwards. Apparently, crime wanted to stay in, as he only stopped a couple more muggings. He supposed he should count himself lucky, as his arm was still healing from a burn he got from Endeavor a few days ago, and wasn't that flattering, but that didn't he wasn't bored as hell. A gunshot rang out in the night, and a chill went down Kitsune's spine as he pivoted, changing directions quickly. He stopped on the rooftop, quickly taking stock of the situation. It was a gang fight in an empty parking lot, five on five. Looked like it was between the Emerald Mambas and the Demon Riders. A couple of emitter types, a couple of transformation types, but mainly mutant quirks. He may be a little in over his head. He checked his mask computer. Eraserhead was, in fact, on patrol, didn't that man have to teach a class? He pressed the comms, switching them to Eraserhead's channel. Hawks, I'm patrolling here so if you please dash another gunshot rang out, interrupting the conversation between Eraserhead and Hawks, apparently. There wasn't really time to figure out that one though, since he could already hear both men swearing. Hey Eraser Dad, McChicken, the vigilante said, looking back over the railing. He kept his voice light to try and reassure the pro heroes. There's a gang fight between the Emeralds and the Demon Riders in the empty parking lot on 5th and Lotus. Kitsune flinched reflexively as another gunshot rang out. Are you alright? He could practically hear the concern and worry in Eraserhead's voice. This is why he called him Eraser Dad. I'm fine, he huffed, disguising his nerves with annoyance, he may be an adrenaline junkie but he's not stupid. I haven't engaged and they haven't noticed me yet Dash. There was a little girl. Hiding behind a bush, too close to the fight, was a little girl. On second thought, I'll get back to you on that, Kitsune said turning off the comms to the twin shouts of problem child, and kid. He got up, running towards the ledge, and taking a leap of faith. He snapped his wrist forward, and the grappling hook shot out, catching on the taller building across from him. He swung through the fight, feet out to kick a few people in the face as he swung. When he made it over, he landed on the plateau, continuing to move as a few gunshots fired after the solace of his shoes. He spared a glance at the fight. It seemed like the gang fight had all but ended as the gang members focused on shooting him instead. Wow, there are 10 of you and you can't even manage to hit me. Kitsune quipped, continuing to run across the rooftops, 
not daring to risk jumping down to the girl just yet. Are you sure you guys aren't stormtroopers? He dodged a turkey-sized ice cube, he was hungry, sue him, and used the momentum to leap up into the air. Time seemed to slow to a crawl as he pulled a smoke bomb from his utility belt, chucking it down into the parking lot. The panicked screaming of the gang was incredibly satisfying. He snickered, modeling the smoke bombs after grenades was a fantastic idea. Smoke billowed through the parking lot, and Kitsun leapt down, landing next to the little girl. Hey, I need you to get on my back, he said gently, not at all like how he addressed those criminals. She nodded jerkily, and he swung her on his back, jumping up as the smoke started to thin. I'm going to need you to hold on tight, okay? She tightened her grip as he raised an arm, the grappling hook pulling them both onto the roof. He could hear gunshots going off behind him, but his focus narrowed to only running and the little red head on his back. She flinched at every gunshot and attack from a quirk, but Kitsune kept steady. The sound of wing beats swept through the night, and he didn't waste any time finding a place to duck behind the railing of the roof as the two pro heroes, as well as several police officers, arrived at the scene. Kitsune curled himself behind the concrete barrier, pulling the young girl off of his back and into his arms. She was shaking like a leaf, so he tried to calm her down by running his fingers through her hair. It's okay, it's okay, he muttered reassuringly, moving one hand to his mask to turn off the lights. You're safe now. Breathe in for four, and out for four, can you do that for me? In for four, out for four. In for four, out for four. You're doing very well. In for four, out for four. They repeated that for a little bit, and she managed to calm down a little, although she still flinched at the sounds of fighting below. Kitsune narrowed in to focus on the girl. She was about the same age as Eri, with long red hair and blue eyes. He could feel that she had some sort of transformation quirk involving iron. There was a familiar urge in the back of his mind to take it, but he pushed it away. You're safe, okay. He rubbed soothing circles in her back, noting the way that she was shivering, although he couldn't tell whether it was from the cold or from fear. How about this, let's play a game, okay. I'll ask some questions, and you answer them, okay. She nodded shakily. What's your name? M. Morimoto Akumu, she stuttered. Good job, Mori-chan. That's a very pretty name. What's your favorite color? Our red. Like my hair. Mommy said it was very pretty. She's right, your hair is very pretty, like you. Where is your mommy? The little girl shook her head, tears springing up. Daddy said she's where the good people go when they leave. Now he didn't have time to unpack all of that. Well, where is your daddy? She hiccuped, calming down while Kitsune slowly braided her hair. He's on a business trip. Do you know when he'll be back? He said he said Friday. He left yesterday. Has he ever lied about that? The little redette furrowed her brow. Daddy's never lied about that. He only lies about where the cookies are. Good, good, Kitsune reassured her, while privately searching for a Morimoto Akumu in the police database. Who are you staying with while he's away? With with my grandpa and grandma but 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 dash she was full on crying now, and she flinched at the sound of an ice cube shattering. TT there was a villain and they and they dash. Kitsune quietly shushed her, rocking back and forth as best as he could. The picture she painted wasn't pretty. It's okay, it's okay now. How about this, do you want an apple? She perked up at that, and in a fluid motion, he pulled out a red apple from a pocket. She started munching on it, and Kitsune finally had the information he needed on the girl in his lap. Morimoto Izumu, nine years old, quirk, ironclad. Her mother, Morimoto Lamada, died when she was little, and her father, Morimoto Fukio, was currently on a business trip to China. You're doing very well, Mori-chan, Kitsune said, peeking back over the wall to check on the fighting. Thankfully, it seemed that the gang members were focused on the two pro heroes, who had it handled. How about we play a different game, okay? She nodded, rubbing her eyes as he pulled out his phone. He opened a simple game he programmed, one of those match the picture to the word games. He made it specifically to distract Eri if she had a nightmare, or for situations like this. She took to it immediately, using one hand to play and the other to eat her apple. Kitsune pulled her into his lap, sitting up to observe the fight. The fight was over in a few more minutes. 
while the police were busy bundling the gang members into vans, after doing nothing during the actual fight, thanks a lot, the two pro heroes looked around for him. It was hilarious, watching them whip their heads around, so Kitsun let himself snicker internally for a few moments before taking pity on them and turning on the lights of his mask, his favorite pastime was messing with Eraser, sue him. Hawks noticed him first, pointing up to the ledge they were on. He grabbed the eraser head under his arms, flying them up to the rooftops. It reminded him of a falcon flying a grumpy cat, and he was glad his mask was still recording. This was comedy gold. Mori-chan, it's time to go, he gently nudged the little girl, taking his phone back and putting it away. He stood up, holding her carefully in his arms. Her messy braid whipped gently in the wind, starting to come undone as the vigilante didn't have anything to tie it with. Problem child. Eraser head shouted, landing neatly and running over to them. Hawks took a little more leisurely pace behind him. I swear, you're going to give me a heart attack one of these days. Kitsune shrugged, the little girl still in his arms. Her eyes were wide as she looked at Hawks. Number 12 hero and all that. Look, if it wasn't going to be me, it's going to be one of those brats you're teaching. Eraser head leveled an unamused glare at him. You're barely older than those brats. Hawks finally made it over, one of his feathers moving to dance in front of Morimoto, to her absolute delight. Who's the little bird? He asked casually, with a hidden emotion behind his eyes. Kitsune spent too long honing his ability to read people for it to slip by him. He handed the star-struck little girl to Hawks. Morimoto Akumu. Her father's Morimoto Fukio, currently on a business trip till Friday that he left on yesterday. She was staying with her grandparents, but they got caught up in a villain attack. She got too close to the fight for me to reasonably leave alone. Hawks nodded, wrapping one of his wings around him for the girl to pet. I'll bring her down to the station so that we can call her dad, he said, nodding towards Eraser. I'll meet you at the Udon place. He took off, leaving the pro hero and the vigilante on the roof. Kitsune raised an eyebrow, although Eraser head couldn't see it from underneath the mask. Is this about the trigger case? Eraser head shook his head. A different case. Hawks was assigned to the same one I'm on today, which means I have to take the time to brief him on it. He tilted his head, trying to do his best impression of puppy dog's eyes with a mask covering his face. A different case? What is it? If the oh so great hero public safety commission is getting involved, it's gotta be something juicy. And involving a lot of money, but he kept that thought to himself. It's your case, problem child, Eraser head said gruffly. Kitsune exaggerated his surprise, raising a hand to his chest. The commission wants to catch little O. Elmi. I'm flattered. The perpetually tired pro hero rolled his eyes. You can come to the briefing. Considering it's about you. Hmm, Kitsune shifted, raising one hand to his chin and tilting his head as if he was considering it. On two conditions. Name them. One, he said, raising a finger. It's just a conversation. No trying to capture me while we're talking. When the hero nodded, he continued. Two. Buy me food. Eraser head cuffed him upside the head, and even through the mask, he was pretty sure that the hero could feel Kitsune's shit eating grin. Fine, problem child, he muttered, then started taking off across the rooftops. Kitsune grinned, jumping alongside him as they made their way across the city, adrenaline pumping through his veins. He had a short list of heroes he worked with or even talked to in his three-year vigilante career, and one of them was Eraser, simply because he treated the vigilante with respect and never tried to bring him in. Well, he did in the beginning, but their relationship had settled into one of a partnership. They stopped in one of the better parts of Musudafu, a district he's never patrolled in before, he focuses on the poorer districts. They made quite the sight, a semi-well-known vigilante and an underground hero dressed like a hobo picking up food. Afterwards, they swung up to the rooftop, and Eraser passed him his food. They sat back to back, Kitsune pushing the mask up to rest on top of his head as he dug in. They sat there quietly, the peace and quiet soothing to the young vigilante, as it was rare to have in his line of work. He could hear Eraser texting something, probably Hawks to inform him of the situation. By the time the winged hero had arrived, picking up his order, they had both finished, and Kitsune had his mask back on. So, he got up, leaning against the railing and folding his arms as he faced the two heroes. Underneath his skin shadow cloak buzzed, 
ready to activate if he needed a quick escape. I heard that the number 12 pro hero was assigned to deal with little o elmi. And that eraser dad was going to brief you on my file. So, I'm going to listen in, because I'm awfully curious about what the police have on me, and then I'll offer you a deal. They both looked at each other, surprise on both of their faces. Kitsune leaned back, flexing his hands to make sure the spikes in his knuckles still worked. They did. All right, Eraser said, getting straight to the point. This is Kitsune. He's been on the scene for three years now. We know his hair is green, although whether it's dyed or not is unclear. He's a teenager, we've guessed between 15 and 19, and small and fast. We have no idea what his quirk is. He has a grappling hook in those bracers of his, and based on the conversations he seemingly has with himself, we've guessed that he has a partner named Sher Yoni. His current charges are vigilantism, multiple cases of assault against criminals, multiple cases of theft from criminals he subdued, and a few cases of arson. He vapes, which isn't illegal but is worth mentioning. He has a very efficient combat style, able to hold his own in fights, and usually leaves the criminals barely injured, with only a few cases of injuries bad enough to need to be hospitalized. He'll also leave tip-offs for the police for things that he can't handle by himself. We've seen him use a bow staff that pops up, as well as a variety of knives, multiple which were identified as knives he's stolen from criminals- dash. It doesn't count if they stabbed me with the knife. Yes it does. Anyways, he's been seen electrocuting criminals with his staff, but it's unknown if it's part of his quirk or if it's a part of the staff. He's a slippery little shit, and doesn't really get caught in fights, usually he's caught after the fact. He's semi-known in the public eye, as there have been some videos leaked, but he's not well spread. That's it? That's gonna change soon, Kitsune said, drawing eyes to him. I made a Twitter account. It's Daria Kitsune if you wanna follow. Why da instead of the? Hawks asked, already pulling out his phone. Some bastard already took Daria Kitsune. Eraser head sighed, probably already feeling the incoming headache that was about to be inflicted on him. Problem child, why are you like this? Kitsune did some jazz hands. It's the trauma. Hawk snorted mood while Eraser just put his face in his hands. What's this deal you mentioned earlier? He asked. Well, Kitsune drawled, making sure both pro heroes' attention were on him. I need to be able to pay a little something called rent. You need a little something called information. So I have a deal. 5,000 yen per question. I have the right to veto any question. When we're done, you give me the money in cash and we part our separate ways. The two heroes looked at each other, a silent conversation between them. I'll pay for the questions, Hawks said, using a wing to lazily gesture to Eraser. You ask the questions. You've known him the longest. What is your quirk? Kitsune laughed. Sorry, Eraser Dad, you're not going to get me that easily. Worth a shot, he muttered. Why did you become a vigilante? Kitsune tilted his head, judging whether or not to answer. Eraser was clearly asking him questions he asked before, questions that he usually shut down. I've always wanted to be a hero, for as long as I can remember, he finally said, a little bit of wistfulness in his voice as he let a bit of the mask drop. But I could never get into a hero school. Why not? Eraser asked. Is it because of your quirk? Everything comes back to that nowadays, Kitsune replied. He pulled out one of his knives and started playing with it to ease his nerves. You've always wanted to be a hero, so why do you steal from criminals? Like I said, I've got bills to pay, Kitsune shrugged, the knife easily flipping through his fingers. Besides, I can't get a legal job. Why can't you get a legal job? Hawks asked after slurping up a bunch of noodles. Because legally speaking I don't exist. The two heroes looked incredulously at one another. Not a single medical file. Eraser asked in complete shock. Kitsune shook his head. I checked, they're all gone. Were before I managed to get to them. And I sure as hell haven't been adding more. Problem child, you've been stabbed multiple times. Hell, you've been shot multiple times. You haven't gone to a hospital for any of it? Do you think they'd treat someone who legally doesn't exist? Kitsune asked. Besides, hospitals are a no-go. Either they'd test me and then the commission would pluck me up to secretly murder me, or I'd be assassinated. Personally, I like being alive, thank you very much. 
How old are you anyways, kid? Hawks asked, one eyebrow raised. Depending on your age, the commission would either charge you for vigilantism and put you behind bars, or they would try and rehab you to be a hero. I'm pretty sure secret murder is off the table, even for the commission. Kitsune snorted. I can't disclose my age, but I will say that they would definitely murder me if they find out exactly who I'm related to. And who is that? Kitsune leaned forward, his center of gravity far enough back that he could still escape if he had to. Wouldn't you like to know, feather boy? Eraser groaned as Hawks broke out into laughter. Once the chuckle fuck calmed down and Eraser seemed to stop questioning his life decisions, the elder hero asked, how did you know what to do with Morimoto? It was Kitsune's turn to sigh. A lot of experience, he said. I'll tell you this because it's been a good day. I have a younger sister. She's my little sunshine, and everything I do is for her. And by the way. Kitsune's stance shifted from easy going to threatening, the knife he was playing with landing in his hand. If you hurt her, I will kill both of you. The two men shuddered, and the vigilante leaned back, going back to flipping the knife up and down in his hand. That'll be all for our little Q&A session, he said. 10 questions 50,000 yen. Cash please. Hawks fished out his wallet, pulling out the bills and handing them to the vigilante. Kitsune put them away, giving them a little salute. Pleasure doing business with you, boys, he said, before leaning back and falling into the alley, letting the shadows envelope him. So, that's the infamous Kitsune. Hawks asked, finishing up his noodles. Shout aside, looking back in the direction the vigilante had just left. He could already feel a headache coming on. That's him. I can see why the commission wants him. Shouta turned back to the hero. What does the commission want with him? Hawks dumped his empty plastic container into the bag, stretching out his wings as he did so. They want to rehab him, turn him into a hero. Even if he was over 18, they probably would have done so. He's a good kid. Shouta raised an eyebrow. He threatened to kill us. Only if we hurt his lil sunshine, Hawks shrugged. Besides, you would kill for your students. There was a lull in the conversation. Hawks spoke up, the wind ruffling his feathers. Look, I know your stance on the commission. And you obviously care for the kid. What's your point? Shouta grumbled. You're against Kitsune falling into the commission's hands, Hawks stated simply, as if he was stating that the sky was blue. So am I. Shouta raised an eyebrow, gesturing for him to continue. I may be a part of the commission, but I don't agree with everything they do, Hawks said. He's a good kid. I don't want them to break him. I'll help with the investigation, but I'll do what I can to make sure he stays safe. Chapter 2, A Usual Day Kitsune pulled himself up onto the balcony, unlocking the door and sliding it shut behind him. He locked it carefully up behind him, slinking to his office and stripping himself of his gear. First were his brass knuckles, then his bracers. He pulled off his mask, turning off the soft green lights, then his elbow braces. Then he unbuckled his belt, letting it fall to the floor, and tucked his compact staff into it. He painstakingly pulled off his specialized high tops and his knee braces, finally pulling off the dark green sleeveless hoodie. He pulled off his Kevlar vest, the cream and dark blue undershirt that went to his elbows, and his dark blue cargo shorts. Finally he pulled off all of the knives on his person, as well as the fingerless gloves. Midoriya Izuku, no longer Kitsune, could finally breathe as the last of his vigilante mentality was pulled away from him. He stashed all of his vigilante gear into a special bag, then tucked the bag into a special compartment in the closet. He pulled out a pair of ratty sweatpants and a tee that he got for free as a part of some sale, stretching and feeling his spine crack. He crouched down, quickly opening up the safe and taking a look. With a sigh of relief, he deposited the money that he got from patrol. Maybe he can get a few hours of sleep before he has to. The shuffle of socks on wood pulls him out of his head, and he turns to the doorway with a soft smile. Aerie stood in the doorway, long white hair going down to her waist and the horn on her head fairly low, although still a few centimeters because of the practice they've been doing. She wore one of Izuku's old shirts, a ratty tee that said long sleeved shirt, which went down to her knees, and fuzzy socks that bunched around her ankles. A blanket was draped over one shoulder, and she had the stuffed bunny that she always carried with her. Hey, Eri, Izuku said gently, closing the safe. Did I wake you up? She shook her head, 
clutching the bunny clothes. I woke up because I was hungry, then I heard you come back, she muttered, wiggling her toes. It warmed Izuku's heart that she trusts him enough to come to him. Do you want a small snack before going back to bed? He asked. She nodded, then paused. Can I can I have apple bunnies? Izuku smiled, getting up and walking over. Of course, he said, using one of his quirks to pull an apple out from behind his back. Here, let's go to the kitchen. I'll cut this one up for you, okay? They slowly walked over to the kitchen, Izuku holding Eri's hand and the apple in the other. The apartment wasn't necessarily in a great part of town, but it was clean, which was the important part. It was pretty bare bones, aside from Eri's drawings taped to the walls. Most of the stuff that furnished the apartment was previously trash on Dagaba Beach that was functional enough to be dragged back to the apartment and used. Food and bare necessities were bought with money from Izuku's night job, and the rest of the money is put away in a rainy day fund for Eri. The little girl took a seat at the table, a long yawn escaping. Izuku smiled fondly and pulled out a knife, falling into the rhythm of cutting up the apple, letting them form into little bunnies. He set the apple slices onto a plate, gently plopping the plate down in front of her. About a year ago now, Izuku first found her in an alleyway, running from overhaul. He was helpless as the man dragged her away, back to the hell hole. Fortunately, Izuku had been a vigilante for two years by then, so he donned a different mask unrelated to Kitsune, snuck into the Shihasakai compound, and rained hell to get her back. Now, Eri was his little sister, his little sunshine, and he was proud of the progress they've made. Izuku shook his head, shaking off the cobwebs of dark memories, and sat down next to his sister. They sat in comfortable silence, Eri eating her late night snack and Izuku braiding her hair. Izunaya-kan, what are we gonna do tomorrow? Eri asked, while munching on an apple slice. He smiled reassuringly, continuing to braid her hair, even though she couldn't see it. Well, we're going to go to the library. He homeschooled Eri, taking her to the library and teaching her from various books. And then afterwards, we're gonna go to the beach and you're gonna continue practicing with your quirk. Eri smiled back, standing up and moving over to put her plate into the sink. She insisted on doing as many chores as she could, so one of the chores that Izuku gave her was clearing the table after meals. He looked up at the clock, seeing that the time was about 3 in the morning. All right, little sunshine, it's time for bed, okay. She nodded, another yawn escaping, and they went to the bedroom. It was pretty bare, like the rest of the apartment, but they managed to get a bed frame and a mattress. There were a few blankets that Izuku had sewn from scraps of fabric, and at one point he had managed to get enough money together to buy a couple of pillows, and there were a few throw pillows that he made. Eri paused in the doorway, tugging at Izuku's hand to get his attention. He turned to her, and she fiddled with his hand, the scars over his hands and arms noticeable in a short-sleeved shirt. Are you hurt? I can help. Izuku smiled, cupping the back of her head with his free hand. Don't worry, Eri, I only have a few bruises. They don't need your quirk, they can heal on their own just fine. Eri was aware of his night job, although not of the details, and she often insisted on using her quirk to help his injuries. Izuku only let her help when it was absolutely necessary, even though she has a pretty good control over her quirk now. He wanted Eri to live as close to a normal life as possible. She nodded in satisfaction, bringing them both into the bedroom. Izuku lifted her up into his arms, three years of vigilantism making him fairly strong, and laid them down onto the bed. He curled them together onto the bed, pulling the blankets over them and pulling his sister close to his chest. Eri clutched onto his shirt with one hand and tucked her bunny into her chest with the other, and Izuku's hand settled around her back and head. Izunaya-kan, can you tell me a story? She whispered. He smiled, pressing a kiss to the top of her head, and started quietly talking, letting stories of his escapades as Kitsune lull them both to sleep. Izuku grinned as he walked to the beach, bag over his shoulder and Eri on his back. They were walking to Dagaba Beach, where they usually went to after they were done with Eri's school and Izuku's online classes. The beach used to be a complete dump, but three years of on and off cleaning had reduced the amount of trash by about half what it used to be. In the beginning he was hardcore clearing for physical training, but now he does so on and off. The trash is useful to help Eri practice with her quirk, and the obstacles are useful to keep eyes off of him so that he can practice with his quirks without drawing suspicion. 
Izuku himself was dressed like he could probably live there. He had on his red high tops, the non-modified, normal versions, and fingerless gloves, dark blue white jeans with a rip and a patch over the knee, a red and white jacket that also had patches, and a white tee that says pants. He had his studs in, he got earrings during that time, and his long dark green hair that reached down to just below his shoulders was currently in a messy low ponytail. His bag was covered in Aries stickers. His clothes were clean, but you could tell that they were found in a thrift store and stretched to last as long as possible. Aerie was dressed better than he was. She was wearing a pair of simple pink sandals and a simple dress that Izuku made with light blue fabric that had unicorns printed on it. She wore the locket that Izuku gave her, a simple gold heart that used to belong to his mother, and a sun hat that covered her horn. Her hair was pulled back into a braid, like usual, tied with a simple hair tie with a flower on it. All right, little sunshine, I'm gonna put you down, he said, kneeling down to let her get off his back. We're going to start with some simple warm-ups. Do you want to work on precision or strength? Eri scrunched her nose, sticking her tongue out as she thought. He always makes sure to give her options on what to work on, something that both of them haven't had in the past. Eventually, she said, I wanna do pre ci Zion. Izuku beamed, pulling an apple out from his sleeve. He placed it in her hands, taking the sun hat gently off of her head. Warm up time. Start with turning it into a blossom, all right. Eri nodded, furrowing her brows in concentration as she focused. Her horn started to glow, a soft yellow light enveloping it, and the apple also started glowing. With a pop, the apple quickly reverted into a blossom, and the glow disappeared. Good job Eri, he said, and she preened at the praise. He took the blossom and tucked it into her hair. Now, let's do that again, but a little slower this time. She took the apple he offered, biting her lip as she kept going. They did that a few more times, the process of turning the apple into the blossom going slower and slower each time. By the time they finished, she had five apple blossoms in her hair. The point of the exercises, despite its repetitiveness, was to master controlling the flow of her quirk so that she can control how much she's using it. All right, we're going to work on precision now, okay? He said, guiding her to the trash mound still there. Pick out something to work on today. She gazed over the mound, before pointing at something on the side of the pile. Izuku used one of his quirks to pull it towards him, it was an old handheld game device. Perfect. So, we're going to start with sensing what it is you can affect with your quirk, okay? He got a nod in return, so he gave it to her. I want you to close your eyes, and try to feel. She closed her eyes, her horn glowing but the device not glowing like when she uses rewind on an object. Eventually, it stopped glowing, and she opened her eyes. Izuku had pulled out one of his notebooks and pens, the notebook labeled Aries training. How did it feel, little sunshine? He asked. It felt like, it felt like I could touch the thing, umm, device, with my hands, but they weren't my hands. Like they were a second pair of hands, like ghost hands, and I can touch what was inside the device too. It felt really weird when I started touching what was inside the device though, like my hands were really cold. Okay, that's very good, Izuku said, writing everything she said down. Now, try doing that again, but using your quirk on something inside the device, okay. Eri nodded, closing her eyes once again. Her horn started glowing, and so did the device, but as Izuku watched, he couldn't see the device changing from the outside. His eyes widened as he backed up, his hands moving up as he activated his quirk before. The device flew out of her hands, and Aerie's eyes snapped open as her quirk stuttered off. The device rocketed towards Izuku, but halfway there, the device exploded. Soot stained the sand underneath it, but thankfully both Izuku and Aerie were spared of any burns or soot stains. That was very good, Aerie. Izuku smiled, willing his heart to calm down from its palpitations. He may be an adrenaline junkie, but the heart attack of something almost exploding near his little sister was too much. But next time we're going to practice from a distance. Her eyes were wide, and she was shaking a little. I'm sorry Izu nii dash. Hey, it's okay, Izuku dropped down to his knees, holding her gently by the shoulders. It's not your fault, I should have known better. But now we know that when we practice, it's going to be from a distance. It took a few minutes for Eri to calm down, but eventually she did, 
and they continued to practice. Izuku pulled interesting looking pieces of trash for Eri to practice on, and Eri used her quirk on something inside of the trash, from half a meter away from this time. After a few more hours, they headed home, and Izuku treated his sister to some mochi with dinner. They may be a little strapped for money, but that didn't mean they couldn't treat themselves sometimes. Izuku opened his notebook after dinner, and Eri listened to present Mix radio show while she colored. He updated his notes on Eri's training, based on the progress they made today, and then opened a different, secret notebook, simply labeled Kitsune. This notebook had notes on his quirks, as well as support items and fighting styles. He took some notes, before ushering Eri to bed and then going out into the night. Quirks. All for one, the user can give and take away quirks on contact. This contact is limited to the user's fingers, but the user only has to use a minimum of one finger. The process takes at least 2.351 seconds, which was a result of training. Victims don't feel when their quirk is taken, with the exception of mutation quirks, which results in pain for both the victim and the user. The user does not take any mutations or physical characteristics that don't relate to the quirk. Any physical characteristics related to the quirk only appear when the user actively calls upon the quirk, otherwise they don't appear. A secondary aspect of the quirk is the ability to sense quirks and their general types within a 30 meter radius of the user. The quirk is partially sentient, causing urges within the user to take quirks and hoard them for the user. The quirk also allows an immunity to the normal effects of having multiple quirks in one body, which is insanity. The current user obtained this quirk genetically from the father's side. Attraction of small objects, the user can pull small objects from the user, previous testing and training put the maximum amount that can be pulled at 10 kilograms. The current user obtained this quirk from the previous user's death, Midoriya Inko. Boost, the user's physical strength and agility is minorly enhanced. The current user obtained the copy of this quirk from All for One, who acquired it from an unknown user. Shadow Cloak, the user can cover their entire body with a cloak made of shadows. The cloak is only effective in dim lighting or shadows, otherwise the black cloak sticks out. The current user obtained the copy of this quirk from All for One, who acquired it from an unknown user. Resistance, the user's resistance to the elements is fairly increased. The current user obtained the copy of this quirk from All for One, who acquired it from an unknown user. Crow, the user can turn into a crow at will. The time it takes to switch between forms is currently 3.41 seconds. As a crow the user's mind is still human, although they may gain some instincts as a crow. The current user obtained this quirk from a drug dealer trying to kill them whose name is unknown. Deflect, the user can throw up an invisible but strong barrier by crossing their arms. The barrier isn't indestructible, but is fairly strong, and hasn't been broken through yet. It is currently unknown the force it takes to break through. The barrier is 1 meter in diameter and forms in front of the arms. Once the barrier is put up, the barrier will remain up until the user uncrosses their arms. The current user obtained this quirk from a mugger trying to mug them whose name is unknown. Apple summoning, the user can summon apples from thin air. The apple can only be pulled out from a place out of everyone's line of sight, including the user. The apples are always ripe, but the user can change which kind of apple they produce. The current user obtained this quirk from a robber trying to kill them whose name is unknown. Confession, if the user's question is answered, the user can force the victim to answer the question truthfully. The answers are always very literal to the questions, and the responses will be what the targets believe to be true, not what is always true. The current user obtained this quirk from Shin Nemito of the Shihasaikai. Chapter 3, A Collision. Izuchin, 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 and me are returning from the grocery store. Eri sang, skipping along next to her brother. She had a couple of bags of stuff, the lighter bags that she could be able to carry. Izuku walked next to her, holding the heavier bags. Izuchin, 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 and me have food galore. Izuku chuckled, keeping a steady pace with the energetic eight-year-old. Galore was one of her vocab words. They were going out together, so Eri has a hat that covers her horn. Her hair is also cut a little shorter, down to her shoulders instead of her lower back, and dyed green, so that the siblings look like siblings. What do you want for dinner tonight, little sunshine? He asked. They were walking through downtown Musudafu, in a district that was still relatively poor but nicer than their neighborhood. At least they looked nice enough that they only got a few weird looks. She thought very hard. Katsudan. She asked. 
It seemed she inherited her brother's love of the dish. Izuku smiled. Of course, little sun dash. Boom. A series of explosions blew up nearby, where a crowd was starting to form. The two of them took off, coming up behind the crowd. He could hear the crowd, but could only pick up hostage and kid. Izunaya-kan, you'll save whoever the villain has, right? Eri asked, eyes tearing up. Like you saved me. Izuku was about to object, but then the crowd shifted, and he got a look at the situation. Four pro heroes, two of them covering crowd control, and two of them standing around doing nothing. A villain made of sludge, holding a kid his age with spiky blonde hair and an explosion quirk, and brilliant red eyes that he'd never forget. Kikin. Eri, you stay right here with the bags, alright. Izuku said seriously, catching the little girl's attention. She nodded, and then he took off, pulling out one of the knives from his jacket sleeve. Thank All Might for his constant paranoia and refusal to leave the house without at least one knife on his person. His mind started racing, and time seemed to stop around him as he watched the situation. The sludge wasn't solid, but it seemed like the eyes were solid. He should be strong enough from his many years of physical training to just pull him out, even without boost. Mind made up, time kicked back into gear, and Kitsune, not Izuku, felt the familiar pump of adrenaline in his system, the world kicking into focus. He barely registered shouting as he jumped over the police tape with practiced ease, whipping the knife with muscle memory and the adrenaline high. The sludge villain roared as one of his eyes were cut in half, giving Kikin a few moments of air. Kitsune grabbed onto one of Kikin's free hands, changing direction and pulling the blonde out with a pop. They stumbled backwards, Kikin not resisting as Kitsune dragged him back towards the police tape and away from the villain, prioritized the rescue. He could feel Kikin's eyes on him, wide-eyed in shock. I am here. It was only due to years of instincts that let Kitsune anchor himself to the concrete wall, his other arm wrapped around Kikin's waist to keep him from flying with the force of All Might's punch. The scent of caramel filled his senses, and he grounded himself in the rain that spontaneously appeared to keep himself from drifting into childhood memories. Experience kicked in, and while Kikin was a ghost of his past, right now he was a scared civilian that almost died. Kitsune grabbed his arm, gently maneuvering them to the paramedics, picking up his knife on the way. He wiped the blood and sludge off on his jacket, then slid it back into the holster under his sleeve. Ma'am, I'm fine, but he needs to be checked for infection, Kitsune said, his voice steady and gently firm where Izuku's voice would have wavered. Kikin was hacking beside him. The sludge got in his lungs. Kikin was still staring at him as he sat down in the ambulance, being checked over. Kitsune started doing some basic breathing exercises, letting his mind empty out before opening his eyes again. Izuku looked out this time, his eyes sweeping the area. Eri was still dutifully sitting by the groceries, All Might was distracting the press before fleeing for some reason, that's a lie, he knows why, and Backdraft was still managing the fires and the crowds while the other heroes walked over to him. Oh boy. The three heroes started praising Kikin for his strong quirk and bravery, and then started admonishing Izuku for his stupidity. Now, Izuku was the anxious, easily flustered nerd, the anxious yang to Kitsune's sarcastically confident yin, but he was still slightly high from the adrenaline rush. So he did something stupid. Excuse me, but what gives you the right to scold me when you three were standing back and watching a kid die? Izuku snapped, officially done with everything going on. Backdraft could have handled the crowd on his own, and I have no doubt that one of you could have thought to throw something at the villain's eyes. Look, kid, Kamui would said, apparently the unofficial spokesperson of the three. He was visibly nervous, probably of the media catching their attention. We were waiting for someone with the right quirk to come along dash. Bullshit, Izuku snarled, low enough so that hopefully Eri didn't hear it. I didn't use a quirk to throw a knife at the villain's eye. I'm sure one of you could have thrown a rock and been just as effective. Death Arms spoke up this time. Not everyone has an analysis quirk like you do Kid Dash. Ha, an analysis quirk. Kikin was the one who shouted this time. He's quirkless. They all rounded on him again, and Izuku was officially getting fed up with everything. He slapped Kikin's arm out of the way as he dodged the pros, running over to the police tape. Wait, we need your statement. One of the police officers shouted in vain. Here's my statement, Izuku said, stopping before the tape. Three pros stood around and did nothing while a quirkless kid did their job. Ignoring the shouting behind him, 
the media included no doubt, he leapt easily over the police tape, his heart starting to slow as he made his way to Eri, the crowd parting easily for him. Eri was standing where he left her, holding all of the handles of the bags in her hands, even though they were on the ground. She grinned, bouncing on the balls of her feet. You saved him. She shouted in delight. Izuku smiled, a soft smile that's reserved only for his little sunshine. That's right, he said softly, picking up his bags again. But that's enough excitement for us today, hmm. Let's go back home. They started walking away, leaving the noise of the villain attack behind them. Izuku focused only on Eri, keeping their own little bubble of calm. They were being followed. Whoever was trailing behind them clearly wasn't used to being stealthy, because they were terrible at it. They hadn't pulled anything yet, so they were likely harmless, but paranoia kept him alive this long, is it really paranoia if they're really out to get you? Hey, what do you think about taking a little break here, he asked gently, stopping at one of the park benches. They were in a park, one still in the relatively good part of Musudafu, so it was clean and pretty. There was a little bit of litter, but not a lot. Eri nodded, so they sat down, Izuku pulling out an apple for her. Don't freak out, okay little sunshine, he muttered quietly but reassuringly. I've got this handled. Her eyes shone with curiosity, but she nodded, staying quiet as she continued to eat. You can come out now, Izuku said louder, looking at the shadow behind one of the trees. If you're trying to tail me, you're not doing a very good job at it. The man stepped out, and he got a good look. He was skeletal, looking like he would keel over if the wind blew too strongly. He had spiky blonde hair that was reminiscent of All Might, and piercing blue eyes. He wore a white tank top and dark green cargo pants, the outfit that All Might was wearing at the villain attack. With what he knew about All Might, and with what he saw at the attack, it wasn't too hard to put together. Izuku patted the bench next to him, and Small Might Sham bled over, clearly nervous. We don't bite, I promise, Izuku said, and that seemed to make up his mind as he took the spot. Young man, I saw what happened earlier. What you did was incredibly reckless and put yourself in danger, but Dash Small Might held up a hand as Izuku was about to interrupt him. It was the action of a true hero. His eyes widened, as the words truly hit him. All his life, he wanted to be a hero, and the only one who really supported him was Eri. To hear his idol, All Might, the one who beat down all for one and gave him a chance at freedom, it hit him. His eyes welled up, the Midoriya gene striking again. You have the heart of a hero, and that's what's important, Small Might said. Izuku sniffed, wiping his eyes. Thanks Small Might. Then they both froze. Eri giggled, her feet kicking off of the bench, and they both looked over at her. Small Might, she whispered to herself, then giggled again. That was what broke the sudden tension, and they both chuckled as well, looking back at each other. How did you know? Small Might asked, eyes filled with nerves and curiosity. You look like a deflated All Might, and you're wearing the same outfit he wore to the villain attack, Izuku said. Plus, you said you were there, cause the media is not fast enough to have already put up footage of the attack, and it makes sense that All Might wouldn't constantly be in his muscle form. You never hear about All Might going to go get groceries, after all. There were other clues, other signs, but Izuku didn't mention them. He figured he'd already stressed the man out enough. Small Might smiled. You're very smart, my boy. Izuku flushed a little at the praise, and Small Might ruffled his hair. I want to ask you something, although you should know that there's no pressure to say yes, he said, and Izuku perked up. But this is something we should do in private. They both glanced back at Eri. She looked up at the curiously, stilling munching on her apple. Little sunshine, I have to go talk to Small Might for a little bit. That elicited a giggle from his sister. Do you want to play on my phone while I'm gone? I'm only going to go a bit into the forest. She nodded, and he pulled the device out of his pocket, putting it into her hands. You know what to do if anything happens, right? She nodded seriously. Scream as loud as I can and throw things. Izuku smiled. Good job. He adjusted her hat, making sure her horn wasn't visible, before turning to Small Might, who was fondly smiling. He lifted his hand, making the universal gesture for after you, so Izuku led the way into the forest, judged that they were a good distance away, then turned back to Small Might. First, 
Can I ask you something? Izuku asked, then continued when Small Might nodded in response. What's your name? I can't just keep calling you Small Might. Small Might snorted in response, then smiled. Yagi Toshinori, he said. I'm trusting you with this. Izuku smiled then. Don't worry, I won't say a word, he reassured the other man. You had something to ask me. Yagi nodded, his face serious. Let me tell you a story. And so he did. He talked about the origins of one for all, and all for one, and how they were slated to battle against each other. He talked about how one for all was passed down, and how he was the recipient, using the power to finally defeat all for one and become the next symbol of peace. He had seen Izuku's actions, and deemed him worthy of inheriting the power. Izuku knew most of the story, and a shiver went down his spine when he heard that All Might had presumed All for One dead, and he was split in two. On one hand, Izuku's quirk screamed at him to take it, to take the power. One for All would give him more power to protect Eri, to protect the citizens he's responsible for, but it would be incredibly selfish. I I'll have to think about it, Yagi-san, Izuku said, his mouth dry at the implications of the symbol of peace offering a great power to him, the descendant of the symbol of evil. That's quite all right, my boy, Yagi said, pulling a pen and a scrap of paper out of one of his pockets. Here, it's my phone number. Let me know when you decide. Take all the time you need to decide. Izuka grabbed the slip of paper, tucking it into one of his jacket pockets. Thank you for trusting me, Yagi-san. Yagi smiled, the smile he's associated with the symbol of peace, but it felt warmer, more genuine somehow. You have the heart of a hero, he said. That's what's important. Bakugo Katsuki was a lot of things, but stupid wasn't one of them. He made it home pretty quickly, and had to deal with the hags yelling about his safety, then instantly being taken to the hospital to be checked on. The doctor reassured his parents that yes, he was fine, there's no infection, but to be alert if something comes up. He thinks he still worried his folks though, because he was pretty out of it, not shouting like he usually would. His mind was too preoccupied with the ghost who had saved him. Midoriya Izuku. They've known each other since they were babies, grown up together. He got to shoot explosions out of his hands by his fourth birthday, Izuku got diagnosed quirkless on his. Katsuki knew that he was shitty towards his friend, anger at the unfairness of the world and praise from his environment funneled into talking down at his friend. The name Zuku turned to Deku, and he wasn't proud of what he did. If Katsuki met his six-year-old self now, he would punt the brat into the sun. Everything changed at six years old. The fire enveloped the house, and Midoriya Hisashi, Midoriya Inko, and Midoriya Izuku were declared dead. There were no remains. Katsuki grieved at the loss of both his auntie Inko and his best friend, even if they were drifting, even if it was Katsuki's fault, Zuku was the one constant in his life. His grief was rage, anger at the world for being so unfair, for taking away Izuku's quirk and then his life, and it escalated, until he was being pulled from school after he punched another kid in the face. He was put into therapy, and at first he hated it. But then he grew, and managed his rage, his grief. He was still a prickly bastard, he wasn't going to change from the brash kid he is, but he started coping with his pain in a healthy way. He cooked instead of snarled insults, trained for UA instead of punching others. The pain never went away, it never does, but it was manageable. 14-year-old Katsuki was a different person than 6-year-old Kukin. And 14-year-old Izuku was a different person than 6-year-old Deku. His parents sat them on the couch, Katsuki facing his parents on the other side of the couch. His dad looked at him with a sad expression on his face, while his mom fiddled nervously, clearly worried but shit at expressing it. That was something he got from his mom. Katsuki, his dad said, being the spokesperson of the two. We're worried about you. He started fiddling with his fingers, tapping the familiar rhythm of the Morse code language he made up with Izuku forever ago. He hoped that Zuku still remembered it too. You don't have to tell us what's going on, his dad continued, when Katsuki didn't say anything. We're scheduling you an early appointment with your therapist for tomorrow, so that you can talk to her. But if you can, you should dash. I saw Zuku. The silence was tense. The moments ticked by, then his mom spoke up. Cat, Izuku's dead dash. I saw him. Katsuki shouted, slamming his hands on the table. He saved me, it was him. He's not dead, 
he's alive. The sound of sizzling wood jolted him out of his head, and he breathed, sitting back on the couch and using his breathing exercises. There was a new set of handprints seared into the wood, this wasn't the first time Katsuki's lost control. At least the fire alarms weren't set off. It took a few moments for him to settle, but his mind was still buzzing. Of course his parents wouldn't believe him, they weren't there. They didn't see Izuku. Katsuki dash. I'm going upstairs, he said roughly, cutting his dad off. He stomped up the stairs, but paused when he felt something slide down his arm, under his jacket. Closing the door to his room behind him, he pulled the thing out. It was a piece of paper, with simply a phone number scrawled on it. Katsuki grinned, the first one he's had since the sludge villain, and plugged the number into his phone. Bakugo Katsuki dash unknown number. Zuku, is that you? Haikaken. Where the fuck have you been? It's a long story. Best told in person. The usual park at 3. Yeah. I'll be bringing someone important to me along as well. You should come over for dinner afterwards, the old hag didn't believe me when I told her you weren't dead. We'll see. I'll see you tomorrow, Kikin. See you tomorrow, Zuku. Your favorite vigilante at Daria Kitsun. Kitsun.png Hello Musudafu, it's your favorite vigilante, the Watcher of the Dark, Kitsun. Here to take down bad is both online and offline. McChicken at official hawks. Hashtag followed. Alright, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.